Uh, <clears throat> thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to apologize right away for both being, um, I have no slides, um, for both being late yesterday, uh, as well as I'm going to leave right after this. Uh, the IOM uh, data sharing report that we worked on for the last year comes out today at 1 o'clock for the public. Um, I can give you a little preview um, before I leave, as long as Maggie, who's in the back room here, can stamp, date stamp this uh, after 1 o'clock so, uh, <laughs> so that I'm not being unethical. Uh, so I, I thought I'd just do a little context setting before we um, uh, bring up our uh, uh, panelists. And I think also we had a conversation in the planning that it was OK if I said something in addition to just moderating the panel. So I think um, when we look at after, we want to certainly set that in a context, because I think even this sort of, and I know that <clears throat> when I talk to the organizers, it's an artificial dichotomy or, or several different facets in the sense of before or after. There's really, in some sense, no, no such thing. But the kind of sort of takeaways from yesterday that I got were that, first, I think it'd be really important if we became a we in this room and didn't have citizen scientists over there, whatever and whoever they are, and uh, us. NIH or real scientists or whatever language we want to use. Um, I started to hear some othering language uh, that I think is not helpful. And some of it was were things, and, and it's really, um, you know, and I'm going to, because I'm not going to other, I'm going to say we um, are using language like, let's let the patients do blah, blah, blah. And when we let people do stuff, it means we're in charge and we're paternalistic. So I'm going to ask us to be careful with our language as we go through the rest of this time together. I think also we feel like we're being studied. And I'm sure that's for both sets of communities. And so if I just put on sort of my citizen science hat, um, I have been studied. We've been studied to see have we log jammed research. And there have been articles written about me, particularly in the 1990s when, when I started 20 years ago when my kids were diagnosed with a genetic disease. Uh, saying that, in fact, I was stymieing research. And once in a while, I feel that again. I don't feel it so much um, in recent years, because there have been formal recognitions of what we've been doing for the last 20 years, and others have been doing for the last 50 years. So you know, PCORI saying there's such a thing as patient-powered research networks that have been actually around 50 years um, is a recognition that's really good. But I think we want to be careful when we say, do we want to study those people? So even when we say, for example, so what should NIH and ELSI do to help those people? Um, let's say we'll all do this together. And so some of the research, even, even the ELSI questions, the research ELSI questions, will come from citizen science and from whatever else we want to call this area. Um, I, I want to ask NIH, what does it mean to do business in this new area? So if we take this, the ELSI system that's been around since Congress said there has to be whatever it was, 6% of the NHGRI budget and then more of each of the institutes have been more and more involved, NCI, et cetera. What does it mean, though, for NIH to not apply the same principles they apply to all the formal traditional research systems to this area? I think it means something different. And I think that nuance needs to be teased out. And I think we've been touching on it. Uh, we, we've heard some good stuff. Sandra had some really great stuff. Some of the stuff that um, uh, was just summarized was really, was really good. I think we also want to say, let's not retreat to a former kind of misperception about ELSI. So I remember uh, three times ago planning for the NHGRI strategic plan. So that's something like 15 years ago, or I'm, I'm sure some of you can remember this. We were in Airely, Virginia, in the retreat center, and someone stood up, in fact, I can remember who it was, and said, ELSI just squeezes the pipeline and prevents things from happening. Remember those, those days? So let's, um, let's stay away from ELSI squeezing the pipeline perception. Now, most of us would say ELSI never squeezed the pipeline. That was a perception. But we all know perception is reality. So um, let's not be afraid. Let's not be um, putting on the brakes because we're afraid. Let's figure out how do we enable the good things that are coming. Um, and, and so then I would ask ELSI. What can enable the passion, the fire? This is a good thing that's happening. We're actually starting to see the public get involved in this science the way they always were in astronomy and ornithology and entomology. Nobody ever thinks of a thing of the Audubon bird counting that happens once a year. Everybody's happy that all those armies go out to sanctuaries and other places and count the birds. Well, let's have us start to count the ways we can uh, further a biomedical research. Then I'd ask, what are the new economies or what other advances can be formed? Because I think when things start, economies get built around it. It's called a network effect. What is the network effect around this if we enable this? 
and how will this actually accelerate the goals we have, even in the traditional biomedical research world. And then I'd further that and say, and let's look at the rest of the world and how it's advanced. You know, there were lots and lots of issues when the banks said, no, no, you have to use my plastic card, not your plastic card, and our cards will never talk to each other in a financial system where there's so much scariness around that data. That got overwhelmed pretty fast when consumers said, I don't want a card for this bank and a card for that bank, and I want to go to the grocery store with the same card. So let's figure out what are we going to do in this space that will enable, be enabled by the things that other industries have already learned. Then I think, um, just a, a second on my own transition. So um, I mean, some now would call me a traditional scientist. I have 140 peer-reviewed papers in PubMed. Some would say, I don't belong here. I have a master's in religious studies and, and never took a science course in my entire life. I've run 30 clinical trials in pseudoxanthoma elasticum. I've, I've managed more than $30 million in federal grants from the major federal agencies. So lots of kind of mixed upness in what I've done, all the way back to, you know, was it ethical when our kids would open the freezer 20 years ago and say, Mom, why does it say ovaries next to the ice cream? Well, somebody with PXE had their ovaries removed and they sent them to us. And so, was that ethical for us to have their ovaries in our freezer? No. Was it a good way to start? Yes. For me, it was a really fine way to start. Did I then call Elizabeth Thompson at um, NHGRI and say, what do I do about doing this in a way that's reasonable and would be more ethical? And she helped me set up our first blood and tissue bank in 1995. So, there, I think there, we're going to see the same kinds of transitions from the garages with PCR machines to this world, and there's no reason to keep thinking of them as separate from one another. Um, there, there have been times throughout those years, and in fact, one horrendously um, sad time when I got all the way to the point of a clinical trial happening here at the clinical center at NIH, and when we got to the point of signing the papers for me to bring in the cash and the people, they said to me, and you can attend the meetings if you'll sit in the back and just carry the briefcase of the, of the real researchers. Th that was maybe 10 years ago, so not so long ago, and I don't want to see us reverting to that kind of world again at all because that is devastating both to the people who have passion to do these things but also to the community overall. So um, I think we also want to make sure that during this time we're, especially the rest of today, and I heard the, the, uh, uh, Kelly give this admonition yesterday, let's stay with the, the theme that NIH needs us to help them understand what we're going to do in the LC area. Uh, this high-tech Venn diagram is fabulous because I think it will keep us focused today. And how do we want to see um, things that have contributed? So for example, traditional advocacy, which I am also a traditional advocate, and I think we should be going away and a new world should come, by the way. But, and that's a whole separate thing. Um, but I think that it has something to say to the world of citizen science, but it is not the citizen science that we're, we've been talking about here in the definition that we see at the top of the paper. Um, and I think traditional advocacy might be only helpful to a certain point because at another point, it's very concerned about sustaining an organization, an industry around a particular disease because of a dying child, because of the passion of a family. And that's all wonderful and great, but it isn't what in general is happening in citizen science. So now shifting to the panel um, and, and just some thoughts to kick us off. Um, in the aftermath of research, what, you know, what are we supposed to be doing? And I think citizen science and citizens or the public or the civic engagement has some of the same LC issues of other kinds of research after the research is done. And in fact, the data sharing report that I'll share with you later is, um, is named some of those things. And so certain things like um, data sharing, lay summaries, what are the learnings that should be put back into the system, and what are the negative results? I probably, us citizen science types are generating way more negative results than positive results, and all that needs to be fed back into the system. What about diversity and inclusion? I'm not sure yet because so much of this is happening in sort of the early adopters, the self quantified self folks, the Silicon Valley folks that we're, we're reaching all the communities that need to be reached and empowered. What about openness to IP? We still see some of the same struggles we see elsewhere. And then there, I think there's some different issues, understanding what does it mean to exploit these new technologies, networks, viral nature of things, online activity, mm -hmm. mobile activity, texting activity for the good, and what are the, what are the ethical issues in there that we never considered in LC because that wasn't an integral part of doing science. 
Um, how do we go beyond traditional motivations? For me, this is a huge one. Incentives are very much aligned in science for tenure, publications, um, you know, what, what questions do we need to ask the traditional system and the citizen science system about those kinds of things and the tensions for what is the motivation? Is it to be cool? Is it because I have a new gadget? Am I technology focused? You know, that kind of stuff I think we want to ask. How do we capture and create good systems that will enable other people to do the next thing without becoming an institution? Every new inst I mean, when NIH was born, it was cool and new, right? And now it's sort of, oh, well, we got to figure out how to move beyond these kind of staid structures. We're going to do the same thing again. We do that as people. So how do we get out of that? And then how do we quickly formalize the good and chuck the bad in a kind of lean startup mode? So I think um, we're going to hear, um, I'm really excited about this panel. I've only met all of you today, really today and on the phone. Um, and I think we're going to hear some really uh, super things because I think we're going to have a lot of diversity in the people who will present. So uh, let's start with um, Julia Brody from the Silent Spring Institute.